delighted to be with you all tonight and honor one of our own, yes. Dr. Tony Medina. Dr. Medina, if you never write another book, <laughs> if you never inspire another child, if you never win another prestigious award, we thank you for what you've already done. Right. So we brought a few of your friends in here to do just that. Medina, man. Medina. <laughs> So, first of all, let me thank, uh, for sure, uh, African Voices uh, for putting this together, and Carolyn and Mariah, and for putting this lineup together as well. I mean, you know, I, I, I find it very uh, fortunate and progressive, too, that we are in a room that was founded by Afro Boricua, and we are honoring a Afro Boricua right now. So, uh, so I'm definitely uh, feeling good about that right now. Um, I have a few things to say about Medina for sure. Uh, yeah, man. So there's this moment uh, in Langston Hughes' writing life where he's being patronized uh, and he's being funded well. And he walks out, uh, this is post depression, and he walks out into the street and he sees uh, a homeless person. And he can't reconcile the fact that he's writing poems on beautifully bonded paper and he's wearing three-piece suits and meanwhile his folks are suffering and, stu and, 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 and hungry. I find that moment in Medina's poetry all the time. It's a moment that when Langston found it, it was a moment where he, I think he became a true poet. Um, as, as, as Medina said in the interview in the profile in uh, African Voices, most people recognize Langston Hughes for his jazz and blues poetry, but a lot of his political poetry is over kind of, it, there's a shade on it or it's not recognized as much as it used to be. And one thing that we learned early as young poets is that we have tradition and lineages to uphold, and we do our best by them. Um, you know, Langston uh, said that uh, he didn't like hanging out with communists because they didn't know how to dance. <laughs> I believe Medina is a true communist because I've never seen this brother dance at all. <laughs> Ever. Ever. And so that's what I believe him, right? Um, see, people know Medina as Dr. Tony Medina. They know him uh, as the poet Tony Medina. They know him as a children's book writer Tony Medina. They know him as an activist. I know Medina as my homeboy, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know him from, from growing up in East Harlem and he was living, living in the same hood and, and basically a typical day for all of us would be, you know, walking down Lenox Avenue, going to Liberation Bookstore, seeing what's in the racks at Liberation Bookstore, crashing the library on 124th Street, reading poems on 124th Street, then, you know, that was our life as young poets living in this world. And then that got kind of larger, you know, we started getting on planes and going to Paris and following, <laughs> following the routes of John A. Williams and writers like that. You know, because we, that's what we admire, that's what we love, and that's what we still respect, you know? And we keep upholding that. So it's an honor for me to be here to, to honor one of my homeboys, one of my yeah. colleagues, one of my, one of my uh, uh, you know, we've all learned from, you know, and, and we'll keep learning from. Um, I can't do justice to any of Medina's poetry as far as reading-wise. <laughs> After that comic poem, and I've seen him do a live version of that comic poem, uh, at, I think at the tea party, when it, it was the tea party, and uh, it was, it dropped, the whole room just dropped when he read it because he summed up the, the absurdity of our lives in this world in just a few lines. But I have to say, as someone who has seen uh, Medina grow, and we've seen me grow, and all of us see, like, seen each other grow, that most, the powerful work that I remember of Medina was always at a point of loss. And uh, it's hard for him to come to that point to read those type of poems. So don't take them lightly when you hear them because just re getting to that moment for Medina is just, you know, it's, it's a struggle. And when he finally gets there, man, you, you hear poems that really go to, to the core of the human soul and, and what it means to survive loss and chaos, you know. So uh, I'm happy to be here. In your honor, I'm going to read two poems by Langston Hughes from Good Morning Revolution, the Uncollected Writings. And uh, I'm going to read two poems that uh, are about my favorite subjects, poets and gangsters. <laughs> so the first is Gangster. And this was published in The Crisis in 1941, still relevant to this day. 
The gangsters of the world are riding high. It's not the underworld of which I speak. They leave that loot to smaller fry. Why should they great Capone's fallen headpiece seek when stolen crowns sit easier on the head? Or Ethiopia's band of gold for higher prices on the market can be sold, or Iraq oil than any vice or bootleg crown of old? The gangsters of the world ride high, but not small fry. Poet to patron, this for me is kind of the embodiment of Medina. What right has anyone to say that I must throw out pieces of my heart for pay? For bread that helps to make my heart beat true, I must sell myself to you. A factory shifts better, a week's meager pay, than a perfumed note asking, what poems today? Thanks, Medina. Tony, I've known Tony for about I think 17 years now. I was 19 when I met Tony. And uh, we were partaking in a, an event for Mumia Abu Jamal at Aaron Davis Hall. It was the orchestra, the orchestra event. And uh, at that point, I had met everyone that I admired except for Medina. <laughs> and uh, Santa Maria Estevez, uh, who's not here, but you know, in spirit, goes, oh, well, he's right there. And you know, I got a little nervous. The first poem I remember for Tony was a um, New York City rundown, European on me. That wasn't allowed. And I was gonna read that, but that's like 19 pages long. And you know, Tony doesn't really write too many short poems besides the Bob comic one that was going. And, um, you know, Medina, he's very sarcastic. He's, uh, he's very loud. Um, he's from New York. I was like, oh, he's like my uncle. And uh, when, I, when we talked, it was, you know, there are still things that me and Tony, that when we, when we spoke, that I still tell my students. And I tell them that you have to read. Uh, you have to read a lot. And you can't expect this just to always be easy. And um, if you ever had the privilege of going to Tony's house, it's really just a library in an apartment and like maybe a bed if you're lucky. <laughs> and um, at the Mumia at the Mumia event, he read this piece, and I had never read and I had never heard Tony read. So throughout the years, I perfected my Medina voice, <laughs> and I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do it because he knows what's going to happen now. And um, but he read this piece, and uh, it's always been one of my favorites. I don't know if you guys. Have your copy of Old School No News Is Good News. Now defunct, how to press. Um, but this is the piece that he read, and I want to read it to you guys now. Because Tony's kind of fresh. <clears throat> it's called That Richie's Wake. Oh my God. <clears throat> when I go, I want people to break dance in the streets, have a circus, throw poetry readings. Blow up the White House, kill the president, rob banks, nap bill collectors, adopt capitalists, interrogate fascists, strangle lazy lunatic looting, tenant abusing, evicting and booting landlords and abstract metaphysical corrupt money, hungry baby booty, hungry hemlock rice and peas, and dirty knees, hungry pedophile priests. <laughs> Just take out the Twin Towers, snap the money changers on Wall Street, cement the Empire State Building with pipe bombs and carpet razors, use my bones to play the drums, bury a grenade in my skull, send it hurling into a limousine crowd of constipated dead capitalist corporate conspirators, throw my body out onto the street, stop traffic, let my arms and legs clog up the runways. Invade the process procession of operations of planes, trains, and automobiles. 
Let my written and recorded words scream and squeal and peel the ears off intellectuals and academics and artists with homes with houses and two-car garages and credit cards and insecure disguises. In alliance with treason, in league with devils and misers, roll my head onto the curb like an absurd bowling ball, taking up pale abstract tourists in rented stowaway tans of man, greedy for more land and more people to serve no need but greed, blasting my palms onto the head of bold, dunsack wearing politicians as CEOs and missiles aimed at smashing up nuclear plants. Factories and bind my books to dynamite and drop them in the lap of racist, right wing, welfare fearing bureaucracies bent on beating down and destroying people divorced from dignity and destiny and determination and self esteem, married to apathy and despair and the unfair welfare of the gangrene of poverty created by finance capital. Turning my passing into a collective deliverance from evil. Make my dying a redemption song, a celebration of life, a reclamation of truth and reason, a destiny's dance with the people's capacity for beauty, the thumbing on the nose of, of apathy, a betrayal of ambivalence, so that even in my death, I will be useful. Yeah. Asha is also born under the sign of cancer. And Tony is born under the sign of Capricorn. Now, those of you who are into astrology know that these are complementary opposites, right? They're like the mother and the father of the zodiac. And so, although Tony and Asher are not old enough to be our mothers and fathers, I have to say that their wisdom and their knowledge in that, Tony and Asher have been like the mother and father to a whole generation of cultural workers and activists and poets. Um, Asha, I have to say, was the poet that I always wanted to be like. Um, and I was blessed really early in my um, career as a poet by Asha's friendship and her advice and her support and her generosity. And I'm really, really thankful for that. You know, it's like having this wonderful, gentle soul um, nurturing me. And so I'm thankful. I've been thankful. Now, Tony, who I claimed as a mentor from early on, was a great mentor. But he was like the mentor from hell. <laughs> and those of you who know Tony understand that I mean that in the most loving way, right? Tony never let me get away with anything, okay? I remember um, one day I was sitting in Tony's apartment and I was really amped because I was starting to do music journalism, you know? So I was getting to go to all these concerts and get CDs, you know, it's all free. So I was really excited about this and I told Tony about it. And Tony's response was, well, what are you doing that for? <laughs> you know, why do you want to do PR for a bunch of big corporations who already have PR people? <laughs> I was like, oh shit, <laughs> you know? And I mean, in the moment it was pretty harsh, but I realized that what Tony was trying to do was get me to think about my allegiances and what I was gonna do with my words. You know, Tony was trying to get me to understand that what I did with my words carried a lot of weight and that I needed to be thinking critically about where I put my energy. And so I thank Tony for that. Um, Tony used to invite me to all sorts of readings and I would go and, I mean, I met Lamont Steptoe because of Tony and Louis Ray Rivera because of Tony and probably Mary Baraka because of Tony. And I mean, back then Tony would read me poems and I mean, I just started to understand this is how it's done. You know, he would read me these poems on Monday, and then by Wednesday he'd have like 50 more poems, and I'd be like, how the hell does this man do this? You know, um, and through his mentorship, I mean, I really learned what a cultural worker thinks like, and moves like, and studies like, and lives like. And Tony was generous enough to also read my poems and give me feedback, and I think the best feedback Tony ever gave me was asking me for my poems for anthologies that he edited. And, you know, it helped me to understand that I had a responsibility, you know, a serious responsibility to reach back um, and to just keep doing the work. So, I love you, Tony, and I thank you so much um, for that. So, Lord knows I cannot read anything like Tony, okay? But I'm going to read a poem um, from My Old Man Was Always on a Lamb. 
which is a beautiful book, if you all don't have it. Um, it came out in 2010, and it's fantastic. The poem I'm going to read is, My Father's Mother Was My Mother. My father's mother was my mother. Not in the Jerry Springer, Ricky Lake, salacious, dysfunctional family way, but in the way it be sometimes when your mom's runs out on you, leaves you in the maternity ward when your pops is nowhere to be found. My mother's, my father's mother was my mother. She didn't get me at the lost and found or at her doorstep cause my moms and pops skipped town. She wrestled me from the metallic green arms of the state a whole year after I was born, as if I were docket number 110. My father's mother was my mother, and the white couple from Queens who wanted to be my father and mother had to give me over to her. This ain't no tragic mulatto story of the black spick baby with the moms with her jones coming down and a pops in the can on a seven year bid. This ain't no daddy was a numbers runner down these mean streets man child in the promised land seven long time story. This is about my father's mother who was my mother, my last of the big mama's mama, my ace boon coon protector and friend with her own nine children and her children's children. This is about what some women have always done, what they continue to do, how they sacrifice and defend. We did a whole lot of free stuff. Tell them my father will tell you that story. <laughs> but I want to ask where we are now in history. Did that do us good to have that kind of exposure? Is poetry a, a more respected genre? I mean, where, where are we now at, at, in this point? Well, I want to just say, is that Mike Ladd over there in the back? Yes. All right. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it's good to see Mike Ladd in the audience. Uh, to him, but Jess, Patricia Spears Jones, these are poets yeah. that I admire. And we all grew up together. Um, I grew up in New York as a poet in the late 80s, as you say, and early 90s with Asha Bandelli, with Willie Padermo, with um, Kevin Powell, Ross Baraka, Paul Bailey, Tish Benson, and you know, all these poets. And, and also the, the folks from the Darkroom Collective. <clears throat> but here in New York, we were um, fortunate enough to be um, directly linked to uh, the black arts poets, mm -hmm. you know, and, and people that came out of the Black Panther movement with um, Sam Anderson. Uh, the first time I met Louis Ray Rivera and Pedro Pritchie at the same time right. was in Harlem at a, at a major reading where uh, Mary was there, Louis was there, and Pedro was there and a host of other poets, and it was a political, you know, uh, forum. And I remember going, um, I was living on 148th in St. Nicholas, and Dave Mills, the poet, uh, came to my crib, and I just wrote this poem called Capital Capitalism is a Brutal Motherfucker. <laughs> and I really, literally wrote the poem in the shower, <laughs> running in and out of the shower. And I yeah, just... Can you get that visual? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I just want to know. Can we just get that visual? <laughs> And, um, you know, I tacked it out, and um, I, Dave came to the door and I said, hey, I just wrote this poem, and I, you know, I want to read it for the first time, but I never read it before. It's a long poem. It's kind of like, you know, I hope I don't get an asthma attack and die in the middle of it. <laughs> so, um, we go to the reading, and I'm nervous because, you know, two of my idols are there right off the bat, you know, Louis Rigsburg and Pedro Pirti. So, um, since it was the beginning of the reading and not that many people were, were there yet, you know, they already had to start the program. And this is right off of Lennox, you know, off of 125th. So we, I get up there, uh, I think Lewis went first, and then Pedro went, and then I read this poem, and it was this long poem, and the audience went crazy. And as soon as I got off, Pedro gives me a big bear hug and said, we've been waiting for you. And that was just confirmation. And the fact that Lewis was the type of person that he would always come up to you, you know, and try to dig what's in your head and what you're writing and stuff like that. 
So we came up at a time period where, you know, we were we were literary, we were into the literature, we were we were um, associated with a movement, a continuum. You know, we had writers that were like probably in their 40s and 50s at the time that we looked up to, and we were able to first read them in books and then meet them in person and work with them. And it wasn't just poetry, you know, you know the teacup mantelpiece stuff that I talked about. <laughs> that was just to be, you know, on the mantelpieces of, of, of rich people just for aesthetic purposes only. It was poetry, you know, for uh, the community and the people. And that's how we learned, right? And of course, by nat quite naturally, what happens is that we are going to be invited to stuff. And the first time we were invited to, to, to read were at colleges and things of that nature. But we would, like if I would get a reading, you know, I would negotiate for some more money. I said, well, I could get you some more poets and stuff like that. And then we would just split it, you know, evenly across the board. Mm -hmm. And we would go on these readings. And I remember we did one for Syracuse uh, University one time. I remember that. I also remember one from Amherst. Should we bring up that one? Yeah, that's the one that Mike, Mike Ladd's people um, used to bring us down every year, or twice a year. And they would even bring a van down to pick us up, and they would come and pick, pick us up at my apartment in Harlem on 116th Street. We would jump in the van, they would drive us all the way to the college, they would feed us, they would get us drunk, they would get us high, we would rock the mic, and they would feed us, they would get us drunk, and they would get us high. And it was just the best thing in the world. <laughs> so, so where are we now, right? I mean, you know, we were just sitting there, we were talking about 123 schools closed in Philadelphia. Yeah. Right? We were talking about um, Chicago, where I spend a lot of time, 50 schools are closed. Yeah. And all the shootings. And all, right, the, all the killings, right? More people killed in Chicago last year than there were soldiers killed in Afghanistan in the same time period. Um, and you know, you know, let's have a frank talk, right? Let's be authentic, you know, in a time of, of um, shrinking institutions and receding economies, you know, and I've got a and child to raise, right? I mean, there are certainly written things I wouldn't have, right? I've said, you know, I, that wouldn't have been my calling, right? Because I needed to check. And so I kind of wonder, and, and you know, that's certainly not all I write, and I don't think it's my contribution. I don't put it on Facebook and say, oh, go look at that. You know, whatever that I just did for whatever, you know, but but I know that I'm not alone in saying that, right? And in, in, in that kind of battle for survival and the one thing you're sort of able to do is not like I'm going to wake up and be a mathematician and you know, all I know how to do is write and parent. Mm -hmm. So where are we, you know, where, and that's me, right? So where are we now in a broader landscape? Well, it's a complicated scenario. I mean, the thing is that capitalism has always been violent towards children, young people, and older people. Totally hostile to that. When you go to a place like Cuba, it's the total opposite of that. They love their children, they love young people, they empower them, and they love the, their elders. You know, they have reverence to the elders. Um, so that's why you see this, this landscape where, you know, they've built, thrown up all these prisons, they're um, closing down these public schools, they want to privatize the schools, they want to keep it keep our kids from getting to college, make it that much more difficult. Um, in terms of the poetic landscape, you know, you know, now we're at a, at, a, at a point where with the social media and stuff like that, you know, we were already the cheapest art form that you could possibly engage in. You didn't need, you know, cameras and all that stuff. You didn't need budgets and stuff. You just scroll on a piece of paper and, you know, read your stuff. You, you read on the streets, you read it in, in coffee houses, anywhere. Um, now, somebody wanting to be a poet, somebody wanting their ideas to be heard, all they gotta do is get on, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever gram, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's a different landscape, uh, and it seems like it's more advantageous um, to the so-called little guy. And as we say this, of course, uh, these major corporations are trying to take over and control the internet and make it you know, a two-tier internet, you know. But do you worry about the disruption of the information? I mean, I think you were talking about a proximity, right, that you had to certain people. I remember being at Hunter and Pedro Pietri, walking in and I almost passed out, 
right? And I was, you know, acting really well. I was like, Mom, well, a student government. You know, and I tried to play it off like that, but, you know, blown away, Nikki Giovanni, meeting her um, at, at someone's house for the first time and her wanting to hear me read. Even Angela Davis, there's so many people just right there, you know, within our grasp. We're about to lose a generation of some of the greatest activists and teachers, some of them, you know, I was thinking that it's heavy on my heart as I was watching Mandela re into the hospital, like this whole generation, and I wonder, despite the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the sort of false ways that we can be connected with one another, has that been disrupted? There's so many things, like with the disruption of education that people don't know, but the, with the dreadful kind of cuts to institutions. Brenda could tell you more. The, the, the institutions are being undermined. Um, you know, trying to get grants is, is hard. I mean, it's, it's been hard for people um, like Gabrielle David, who's been doing Fatitude magazine for like 20 something years, and she's been trying to take it, you know, to um, video and stuff, and now she's doing Two Leaf Press, and other people who have struggled, you know, in terms of institutions and stuff, and they're always trying to um, attack the Black Writers Program at Edgar Evers, mm -hmm. you know. And of course, the publishing world and the little publishing houses and the little, you know, the small booksellers and bookstores are always being attacked. But it's also our responsibility to, to, to put money into those things and to That's keep right. them alive. Um, but in terms of, you know, a, a, the younger generations, the newer generations, the coming generations um, having access to the poet, that's, I think that's always gonna be around. I'm thinking that poets and spaces for people to gather and to hear poetry and to participate in literature, um, things you know, out in the open air, it's, that'll never die. Right, and you know, and I, love, I have to say that like, one thing, I was thinking again about what, what Willie was talking about and Mariah Dessa was talking about it, because you know, I first of all, if anybody's known Tony for a long time, I'm still shocked that you have a doctorate, not that you're not capable, but we weren't doing school well back then, we were dropping out of school, a lot of us going up and down, and so and then Tony, you know, just wasn't around for a couple of years, and then came back, and was like, I was like, I was like, I was one of his broke in his house, I don't know. and he's like, I, this is honestly, like, and then you have, you know, um, a doctorate, I, I, I love that, and I love that, um, and that you were teaching, um, and I think calling Howard back to its great legacy in tradition, right? And doing that teaching, well, I love I had to get the PhD in order to, you know, be able to eat on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, because I was, I was literally teaching at Long Island University oh, Brooklyn yeah. campus for eight straight years with a bachelor's degree. They knew it. They, they hired me with a bachelor's degree, <coughs> um, which was bizarre when I heard the, the, the administrative assistants like, Professor Medina! For the first time, I was like, <laughs> but you know, um, one of the people that said you, you need to hire this guy, um, she always used to say, Barbara Hennig, she's a poet, um, she said, you know, you, you're not going to go anywhere, tell me, in this field if you don't get a PhD, PhD. It just so happened that, you know, something opened up, uh, an opportunity, and by that time I was burnt out from teaching remedial English and stuff like that, I was going to commit suicide. <laughs> In the dark alley, and stab myself in the forehead with her on the ears. But um, I couldn't take it anymore because the, 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 the bad writing was affecting my writing. You know? I was becoming more illiterate the more I took it talk. So um, I said, I gotta get the hell out of here. Plus, I was arguing with these dumb students all the time. You know? And it's only to find out years later that I, was, I would run into them and be like, everything you said was true. It, just, it was so true. I said, okay. Um, so I had to get the degree. I had to go underground to get the degree. <laughs> because, you know, it's hard. Because Mariah was talking earlier about, like, how do you do all these things at the same time? It's hard being a poet in New York and, and a somewhat conscious poet. Well, talk about your students and uh, maybe the, the ones who are not um, more great. challenged or whatever. You, you know, now. Where you draw encouragement from? Like, who's that person, or have you met that person? Like Pedro Pietri said, we've been waiting for you. Who are those students you have now in Howard, and where do you draw? Well, encouragement I mean, from? It's, it's it's surprising when you teach a creative writing class, and this is an undergraduate class. And once 
the word got around that I was at Howard University, people from the community just bum rushed, um, <laughs> the, literally bum rushed the class. Tehemba went there one time to read to the class, and he was like, what the hell? Every, people were sitting on the floor. <laughs> it was hotter than a slave ship because it was like, what, September, right? The beginning, and it's like a swamp in DC. Um, and, and, and he came in there, and he was like blown away. And of course, poetry, you know, the African diaspora is all, you know, rife with music in it and musicality. Um, you know, I always use music in the classroom. Some people, said, some people can't write to music, you know, it's too distracting for them, but I always have it. And, you know, if they don't like it, I'll lower the music down. And it kind of affects them and it kind of manipulates what they're going to write or whatever. So, I mean, I don't think that we have to get back to it. I think that we're already there and we've never left that. You know what I mean? I mean, Willie comes up here and talks, you know, off the top of his head and there's music. You know, you're like, you're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's being very intellectual and down to earth at the same time and there's music running through all that. Bonafide gets up here and he does a poem of mine better than me and he just has asthma like me in the middle of it. And, uh, and, you know, he's going like this and his hair, you know, he copies my hairstyle and stuff like that, but that's another story. Uh, and we, you know, back in the day we were like the Cheech and Chong of poetry, but that's, and so there's music and all that. The thing that we have to do is support poetry from Rise of Color, support the black poets. That means you gotta buy those books. That means you gotta have a library. That means you gotta pass them along and stuff. It's sad what happens. Even, even black children's literature needs to be nurtured, you know? Um, you know, Latin literature and all that stuff has to be, you know, you gotta surround our, our, our kids with that. They have this um, great festival in Brooklyn and stuff a writer's uh, thing out outdoors, but it's a handful of people of color there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bringing their kids and stuff like that. You go to a lot of these festivals, you don't see that many, you know. You have the, um, the Black Writers Conference and they have the, the kiosks and the bookstores and stuff like that. And you know, that's a venue where you get people of color buying and supporting books of color and bookstores of color and publishers of color and stuff like that. If we don't do that, our stuff is going to die, our stuff is not going to be taught in the schools. You know, our histories are going to be, um, you know, covered, you know, like, like some histories have been covered with sand, and, <laughs> but uh, buried over. You got a lot of poets in this audience, you know, who are incredible poets, who have books. They need to be read and passed along and shared, yes. Why don't you tell us about your latest book on that note? On that note? On that uh, note. <laughs> the latest book is called uh, Broke Baroque. <laughs> <laughs> and it's published by, and there goes my publisher right there. Yeah. She's trying to be shy and Gabriel. demure. Gabriel David, can you just raise your hand? I'm just going to um, show you a proof of it. Um, can I just read one poem from it? Yes! Yeah. <laughs> okay, I need, can I use that one? Okay. Sure, use it. All right. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, one of my favorite poems in the book. Have you ever heard of the bonobo? Yeah. The primates? Well, these are primates. Unlike the chimpanzee, they share most of our genetic makeup. They share about 90 some odd percent of our genetic makeup. And they exist in the Congo, and they're separated from the other primates by a river, right? They eat this thing called jungle sop, which is a fruit that, you know, they, they eat all the time. Their body type is slimmer than the chimpanzee. Um, and they come from the matriarchal line, right? They have more sexual positions and variety 
in the Kama Sutra. Right? So, with that in mind, I want to read you this poem called Broke Bonobo. And people are always saying, you know, Tony Medina, he don't, he don't write love poetry. Well, this is a love poem. <laughs> Now, in the poem, you know, I call the Kama Sutra the Karma Sutra. Broke Bonobo. We were separated by a river. She was busy and wouldn't even give me a sliver of banana peel. Although I appealed to her sense of matriarchy, I said, cut the malarkey. Give me a piece of that nana. It's not like I'm asking for much. Or nana. Or manna by Jiminy. It's hard out here for a chimp. In the jungle with no chimney. Swinging from branch to branch. Defending your honor. She said, do me a solid, babe. And fetch me some jungle salt. <laughs> to which I snorted and plotted and clocked about to make her happy. We spent that night wearing out our copy of the Karma Sutra, bending branches, shaming leaves. At one point I caught a draft and sneezed, blowing the whole damn thing. All I wanted to do was sing, let her in on what I was feeling, but she was no longer in the mood. And I tried not to brood. Besides, the moon hung so low, I climbed up on its crescent and spent the night in the crook of its glow while she snored and snored, talking about me in her sleep, sucking her teeth, mumbling, this motherfucker. <laughs> but African Voices is an institution that's here. And it has a presence. And it's been growing every year, and it's been doing things just beyond literature, and also with film and stuff like that. And a lot of times, this is out of, you know, her pocket. You know, and it's a struggle, along with Mosaic Literary Magazine, and Troy Johnson's um, website and stuff like that. We've been able to hold it down, and to make sure that our voices are out there. You know, in institutions like the Black Writers Conference and Mega Everest. I want to thank Asha, Mariah, Willie. Yes. Uh, this kid named uh, Rojas, is it? <laughs> Bonafide. I want to thank all the poets who I know who's in the audience, like Patricia, Spears Jones, to Henry Jess, Mike Ladd, um, EJ, is she here? Yes. yes. Artists like Sandra Payne and Vagabond. Filmmaker, who's a fantastic filmmaker, and Gabrielle David. I want to thank Carolyn, of course, because she is a true leader and a cultural artist. And Barbara Rivera, of course, Dr. Brenda Green, yes. and um, everyone in Troy, everyone who has been part of this, and everybody in African Voices thank at the Schomburg Center. It's really an honor to be here. Um, the Black Puerto Ricans Institution. <laughs>